Um, he also developed a, a web app that provides an introduction to uh, concepts that are used in Bricklayer. And that has a number of exercises just to get just, um, used to using coordinates and, and just the general structure of how things work in coding. So, having said that, I'd like to introduce three girls that are at the Rockbrook Elementary Coding Club. Can you guys come up? I'm going to hand you this microphone. So first, I'm going to introduce Lena. And she's going to explain how to create a Sierpinski gasket using Legos. So it's just a set of instructions to build something. And later, she's going to come from that. Can you say your name and how long you've been coding? And then get a little explanation. My name is Mila, and I've been coding for about three or four weeks now. Um, and Um, and this is how to go to PC. I'll go a script and see that's what I guess. So, first you put a 2x1 layer piece on the top of your base plate. And then, to keep using 2x1 two, two layer pieces in two different colors. So, the first color I put on the top. So, the two dots are kind of like two items. They see negative space and positive. They can put one to the negative space and the other sees positive space. But um, the first color that you put on there, and then if they see the same thing, if they both see positive space, if they both see negative space, you put a different color there. And it always, each line stands one dot on each side. So you stop when you can't go any farther and then you start on the other side and it kind of builds a and it builds in like that. So that's how you do it. Um my name is Mia and I've probably been coding for about three or four weeks. My name is Ava, and I've been coding for about three weeks. So these girls have been coming, and we do the introduction. They're building this, and we, during the coding club, we also get, get examples of actual writing writing code. So the next step would be to have these girls build these in a computer in the bricklayer program, so that we can see that in like a digital designer. Okay. Um, so, I, okay. so this is something I learned how to code using um, Bricklayer, and we were doing a Thanksgiving art show, so I did a regular turkey and a Warhol turkey, and basically I did that to try to just make small modifications to the code to see how it would change, and I've been coding since I don't know. I started with Asia so since October. <laughs> and this is the code that built my turkey. And next, we have Ava. She's in our Sunday coding club at our house. My name's Ava. I've been coding for two or three months. And in honor of Thanksgiving, a program pack. And so I basically so I kind of color coded it, but I didn't have enough of one color. And so this part and this part is the buckle on the hat. And the rest is supposed to be brown, but I didn't have any brown. <laughs> so this is the code that she this is the code that she used, and this is the output. And next, 
essere fatti. Hi, I'm in this class and I've been building for four months now. Um, I made a punk and here's my, uh, these are my clothes I made and here's the code. Uh, um, I've, uh, I made this in my own uh, Halloween. Okay. Hi, my name is Bella, and I've been coding for um, five months, I guess. And this is my code for an algorithm that my dad invented. And basically what it does is you take a one by one brick and you make an L shape. So, and then you take that and make an L shape out of that and that and make an L shape out of that and so on until you get this. So I had to take the smallest L and um, make the L shape with that nine times because I um, ended that triangle line as you can see at the So that's it, I guess. Thank you, and that was really wonderful. So let's have a little hand for all the Okay, so um, the theme for this year is finding IT, and as you just saw, that you know, there's a lot of fun with networks and programming. Now, um, we can, I like to speak a few words about one of the pioneers in of formal interviews. As you know, that the first week of December is designated as Great Opportunity. Uh, one of the reasons for that, I assume, is because she was born on the I think, 9th of December. But there was also somebody even earlier, a female pioneer in computer science, who was born about the same day, 10th December, which is, uh, you know, if you see in your PDA, it allows this. So, Ida was the daughter of Lord Byron, the poet, and her mother, uh, named Anne Isabel Milbank, uh, she was a mathematician actually. So, uh, Lord Byron actually, he wasn't really involved in his family life. He went up to Greece and he died by the time Ada was eight. But his mother, but her mother thought that her poetry would have kind of a bad influence on her life. So, she really pushed her daughter to more mathematical, scientific studies. And that was not very really usual at those days in the 1800s. Um, she was, so, since she was very young, she was exposed to maths, logic, scientific achievements. And one of the, well, not so fun facts is her mother also made her to sit still for several hours a day to have to kind of obtain self discipline. And I don't know how good that is, but. <laughs> now, um, she, she was very interested in this early. So, around uh, 1828, so that was when she was about 17 or so, she invented a, a design for a flying machine. I mean, it didn't probably work, but it was still something to kind of think of and design a flying machine. But her main um, painful thing was when she uh, talked, when she made uh, Charles Babbage, that was in 1833. Now, Charles Babbage had invented a machine called the difference machine. And the difference machine could do certain additions and computations as a machine, because there were no machines to do that, it was people working on. So she invented or wrote code for working on that machine, and in a way she's the first programmer, not the first female programmer, the first programmer that's um, 
Now, George Madrid had other ideas as well. So he had another idea called analytic machine, which would go beyond just addition and subtraction, but the more complicated stuff. But he didn't really get funding from it from the day, because they said, okay, finish the different session and then you'll give you some money to do something else. But uh, there was this uh, person in Italy who was very interested in it. So he wrote a paper saying that the analytic machine is going to be very good and these are the things that can happen. What Ada did was she took this um, article written by the Italian in French and translated it to English. And not only did she translate it, she put in a lot of her own ideas of what the analytic machine can do. And this was kind of obscure research for a long time, and she didn't even put her entire name, she just put AAN, Augusta Ada Lowry, she didn't even put her name on it. But recently, or, you know, about 10, 20 years ago it was discovered, and there's a lot of interesting ideas about, um, you know, how computation can be done in that very early stage. So one of the things that I found very interesting was she had theorized the concept of loops. So most of the little girls who worked on this design, they had to use a loop to keep on repeating the pattern. And back in 1800, she, Ada had thought of you know, using loops, etc. So one quote that is attributed to her in a daily life is, uh, she says that the analytic engine, put it to computer if you want to put it there, so the analytic engine weaves algebraic patterns just as a loop weaves flowers and leaves. So it's a very pretty way of posting it. So that's about her. Uh, it is rest of her week, so if you want to look at rest of her, it's on the other side. And she has a lot of achievements as well. So, um, okay, so that's about the vital part. Now, before we start the panel, um, I would like to introduce Sandy. And she's going to talk a little bit about the lecture. Okay, this is the red chair. This is the red chair. So you can all see what I'm talking about. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Sandy Blesnick, as Sandra just said, and I am the coordinator of the Women in IT activities that we have here on campus. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all today. Uh, we brought the red chair, and it's not somebody said, so what does the red chair symbolize? Does anybody know what it symbolizes? Anybody want to make a guess? Well, somebody guessed one time it was the punishment chair. Absolutely not. <laughs> not what I mean. The red chair symbolizes who's missing at the table. Right? And the problem that we're dealing with, or the challenge that we have, some problem, but the challenge is to get more girls to come. I'm so happy to see you. Welcome. Excited that you're learning to code. Uh, we need more women and minorities at the table, and that's what the red chair uh, and, and what it means. And the name of the campaign is actually the Sit With Me campaign. So I'm inviting you to sit with me and encourage more women to explore computing and to choose IT as a career. So very nice to see you, and enjoy the rest of the program. Okay, so now for the event, so we did a uh, feature, talked about the ALR with that spot, so now I know what's happening in first. We have an exciting panel here, and then we talk about what fun they have with while doing life. So Ilya, who is my co-organizer, and me, we are going to start on the questions. Doesn't mean that we're the only persons allowed to ask questions. Just feel free to raise your hand and ask. And um, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves, and then we can start. <laughs> I'm Delana Rodriguez, and I'm the director in IT at Blue Cross Blue Shield in the West. I'm Stephanie Peterson. I work at Client Resources Inc. I'm currently a business analyst. I graduated about two years ago with computer science and IT innovation. I am Jen Etzler, and I am a manager and consultant at Sajeti here in Omaha. I'm also our Microsoft practice lead. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Grozek. I'm a co-owner of Method Development Work Software Firm here in Omaha, and I'm a graduate from UNO, 96, go Mavs. <laughs> um, I do a lot of uh, technical project spec collection, technical project management, and a little bit of programming. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your introduction. And the first time the question comes, what do you like most about your work? What, what do you like about your work? I guess I'll dive in. Um, I like, uh, because I'm an owner of a company, I get to touch all kinds of different aspects of it. Um, I love doing design of software, so when we have a new idea or when a client comes to us and 
access to um, give them solutions or help in the design process. So we're working with our tech team to do that. And um, I also really love um, testing software. So that's one of my passions. I love to break things and then try to fix it. When I was in high school, what I really enjoyed was solving mock math problems. I even had my math group. I would put that on and then go to the and really just delve into the math problems and really see the clues and sense what time is and it's just like diving into that problem and solving it. And I can really find the same sort of thing delving into technical problems and just trying to find the solution to that technical problem. And um, it's also similar to solving a puzzle. You have all these different pieces that really have no meaning by themselves. And um, by putting them together, you can really create an answer and maybe like answers to questions that haven't even been asked yet. And I just really enjoy solving that problem. So I would also agree with problem solving and kind of designing the solutions. For the position that I have, it's client-based project work. So it kind of feels like you're always on the cutting edge of trying to figure out what's the best solution to the problem that you have, whether that's your business or um, whatever kind of project that you're looking at. What I like best about it is um, I'm in a management position, and I have the opportunity to work with very creative people. IT tends to draw creative minds. And there are all these new things to create, new things to do, and, and there's a lot of change in the IT field and in whether you're a programmer or whether you're a technical project manager or in a management position, there's just always a lot of new things to do and to learn. So it's a very exciting thing. I think our next question kind of requires uh, um, of all the panels, a little exposure to other kind of jobs. If they ever had experience with others on IT jobs, if they could compare it, like what would be the differences? How how would you do your panel uh, a parallel? Um, any take on that? Yeah. <laughs> so um, most of my career has been spent in IT, but uh, prior to that, one of my hobbies was teaching contouring, and so that requires me to be up a lot. <laughs> and I'm creative in it because I come up with routine concepts, but um, I'm up, whereas IT, I'm sitting a lot. So that's one of the major differences I get a lot. So we have to go out, and work, uh, go out for walks and stuff. Um, but one of the other things that I think really applies here is that you're using your brain a lot more when you're doing IT rather than maybe a physical labor. So when I come home, sometimes, my head hurts. <laughs> but but you, you just you, your mind hurts because and you're exhausted from that because you're really doing a lot of planning and you're doing or coding takes a lot, you know, a thought process and thinking through the problems or debugging code or that. So it's a mental mental one other thing that I think is very different is in IT because technology changes so quickly, you're always learning. There's always new things to learn. And I think a lot of other jobs that you do maybe for a long period of time are very similar. They don't change constantly. But within IT, if you like change and like learning new things, it's a great um, place to be. And I also think it makes it challenging in a certain aspect because when clients can come to you asking for a solution, they already have a lot of different um, technologies that they work with, and you have to find a way to bridge those gaps. And sometimes you might be the first person or the only group of people out there trying to solve that problem, and it can be difficult and challenging, but it's also very rewarding finding the right type of solution. I think one thing that I found very different, I came like, in my school, I worked in the customer service industry, and so one thing that was very different for me was when I went into IT, all of my customers were now internal. For example, when I worked at Spivey Corporate, I was working for internal customers. Um, and then the internal customers will take my product and help their internal, their internal customers, like maybe the cashier and the cash register. And so that was different for me. I'm no longer working with the public. I'm working with people within the same organization as myself. So, anybody from the audience, can I continue with a question? We have plenty of questions here, but yeah, please. Um, yeah, 
yesterday developing coding, and she said, boy, once you have two screens, it's really hard to go to one screen and count. How many computer screens do you have on your desk? That we have two. I have already done it. I have a third screen. <laughs> and with the addition of the new 4K TV set, um, I actually, for the price of two monitors, got about a 40 inch monitor, which is kind of like four monitors in one. Um, and no, it's just one giant monitor. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, my dad had an Atari 400 in Omega, so when I was this age here, I was playing video games, a lot of video games, but he also had a basic disquette to go in there, and so we were doing little programs together, so I think he influenced me quite a bit. And I had a, um, when I did decide to go into computer science, what made me stick was just all of the other people in the classes and the professors. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, when I took a class here at UNO, I was pretty mad, and then I took a programming class here at UNO, it was VB.net, and I just really enjoyed coding, so I switched my name. For me, it was my mom. Um, she was in ultrasound technology and x-ray, which is pretty cool technology to think about growing up, and then she got me my first computer in fifth grade. And from then, the video games, and I kind of toyed around with making my own websites, uh, just kind of got to hit those technology. So like you, <clears throat> when I was in school, there weren't personal computers, but I had a professor, or a teacher, a high school teacher, who um, taught just a program, kind of a logic class, and that class came very well to me, even though I wasn't necessarily a, a strong student in math and science, but he said that IT would be a good field for me, we called it MISM, and actually it's MIS degree here. Um, but uh, it was through the business department, and I didn't know what I wanted to go to college to do, and since he suggested that, I thought, why not? And uh, obviously, it's been, uh, it was a, a great choice. But I think sometimes um, young women are discouraged if they don't think they're the smartest at math and science. And I guess I would strongly encourage you to rethink that or you as parents to talk to your kids that there are unlimited career opportunities for young people that aren't necessarily the straight-A students in math and science. Because there are a lot of other skills that it takes to work in an IT job, work in an IT organization, management skills, just interpersonal skills. We have a, an intern who um, is sitting here in the audience, Kiki Mahoney, who is working for us right now. And she didn't want to program and come in in a technical role, but she wanted to learn about project management. And so she's interning with us. And we love the fact that she can explore that aspect of IT and not necessarily not be discouraged by having to go into programming in order to eventually move up into a technical management job. So um, there's just the, the the opportunities are endless and, and the more we can help people understand that, I think the more we'll get students who are going to My my question was very similar to that what you're doing. My other question is, uh, as women in IT, what roadblocks have you come across, and what did you do to solve those situations? I think I was pretty fortunate. I um, have always had great role models, but I hear a lot that other women are, are no, don't do that, or you know, you're not good, like you said, with math and science. You're not good at that, so move on and go do something else. But I've never had that. I've also heard a lot about it, um, but I was also fortunate to have my mom as a good role model. And then right after graduating from ISIT a couple of years ago, the Women in IT program here, I think it's a great opportunity for women to kind of lean on each other and uh, mentor each other. And looking for those opportunities helps support being sometimes the only women in the room. Um, the one other thing I add is, um, I think there are, um, you can 
can think about roadblocks or you can like not focus on roadblocks. So I think for some women they might they might spend a lot of time thinking about the roadblock and not figuring out how to move around it. Or you know, one of the things that's I think very, very important for a young women going into IT is to have a mentor. And often it, it, it could be a, a man who is very supportive of you, maybe it's your boss, maybe it's you know uh, your boss's boss, but having people who look out for you and help you and guide you and that I think if you focus in that way and kind of not pay so much attention to maybe opportunities that aren't happening for you, it enables you to focus where it can help you move forward versus you know focusing on things that are stopping you. So I would like to chip in a bit. So I think it's very important to have somebody who supports you as a role model. So when I graduated from school, uh, the place that I could go to computer science was uh, about you know four hours away from where I stayed. So it was like I had to stay in the dorm. Now my best friend also got the signal mom, so she could go there as well. But the family didn't allow her because they were just too young to be by herself. So you need to let go at some point. So, okay, so back to our list. And um, one thing that I just kind of send you into this is um, there's this idea that I have read in a lot of articles that boys are more interested in IT because there's this video games that make them very excited. So, video games is a boy field, they get exposed to it, and uh, you know, that's how they come to IT. Now, as we saw here, that video game doesn't necessarily mean going and killing a lot of cats. There might be other conflicts too. So uh, the question that we had is, um, is do you agree with this thing that there's too much, you know, violence or adventure like video games that doesn't cater to girls and that's all kind of drives them away from the fun part, or you know, do you think that you know there's still a lot of things that the girls can kind of get into if it's not more this fun, fun idea stuff that they can get into? <laughs> Disagree with that. I played Nintendo when I was younger, and um, Super Nintendo, and I had a Game Boy. Um, Zelda was my favorite game, so I played Zelda a lot. Um, I suppose I'm out of touch now. I don't really have time to play video games anymore, but I don't think it's here for sports. I think it all depends on your interests. So um, it's easy to overlook all the different types of games and fun stuff that we're doing, but having fun on Facebook. Playing Candy Crush, playing puzzle games, there's still fun things that are technology based at the core. And if you're the only girl playing Halo, that's okay, or the only guy playing Candy Crush and has the tips, that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still fun, and I don't think it's swayed one way. <laughs> So, but uh, do you think video games is a good way to introduce girls? Because I know that you know, some of you did start off with that. You did, right? Is games a good way to introduce things? I think it's a good way, but I think um, there are so many other things. Like, if I could do it all over again, I would probably go check out robotics more, because I think the robotics side of things, when we often talk about, hmm, we could move over into that <laughs> arena. It's just such a hands-on um, field. And, and then I also think um, designing, like a lot of us here have talked about designing software. And what these girls are even doing is they are, have found a problem and they're trying to build a solution. And so I think that as well you know, is fun. Do you think games are a good way to get started? Um, Smart games or games for learning uh, is a pretty interesting field, but uh, there are some games out there that you can use to learn programming. Um, it kind of gives you a, a structure to base your skill set off of and have some fun while you're at it. Too. Okay, so the next thing is what was the most exciting project you worked on? And you know, feel free to expand. Take the and everything. Well, I'm, I, I wouldn't say it's exciting as much as just a great learning opportunity. We had um, a system that we deployed that didn't go well, and we had um, 
a lot of uh, several weeks of having to have many people involved trying to get things fixed. So that was many years ago, but I remember that now just because it was such a learning opportunity. Sometimes you learn most in your job from when things don't go well. And uh, it's just something that's kind of stuck with you. I'm sure your projects are a lot more fun than that. <laughs> Um, I've worked on a variety of projects at work, but I would say one of my most fun projects was my senior project for my IT innovation degree. So it's like a senior capstone project where a year and a half was dedicated towards it. Um, and it was fun bringing an idea of my own out to see its fruition. So I got to come up with the idea and plan it and have a team to support me to build up the requirements and do some market research and stuff like that. So uh, the idea itself was called the Wasteless Kitchen. So you have the ingredients that you have in your pantry at home and what recipes could I find that could use up that, those ingredients before they expire or go bad. So you waste less food and stuff. So it was really fun coming up with that idea and talking to people about it and uh, coming up with solutions. And um, you did win the first prize for that, right? <laughs> Interesting project, but um, so I work with information and presenting information, visualizing information. And my most interesting project was at Wellmark in one Iowa, they're a healthcare provider, and um, they had developed a new mobile app so that patients could find healthcare providers. And um, they were interested in who was using their app and what they were using it for. And so my project was to accumulate all that information in a way that they could see what the app was being used for, like when people were using it, what they were using it for, what they were searching for, and really so they could look at these visualizations just to make decisions on how to design the app and like what they could add to the app, what features they needed to add and stuff like that to make the app more useful to the customers. And so I thought that was a really fun project. So um, most of the work that I do is client-based. The client comes to us and um, we need a solution for this and we do that. But uh, a couple years back, probably about four or five years now, um, we had uh, quite a few clients coming to us saying, we have this website, but we want to be able to make changes on it. Okay? And back then, you weren't able to do that. You'd always have to contact the developer to make the changes for you unless you built your own website. So um, we came up with the concept, and at, at this time it was a newer concept, to um, build your own website, right? Because you've heard of those, they're everywhere now. <laughs> um, but we have a product, and we still run it today, called Web Hornet, where um, customers can come in and either rebuild the site for them, and then they can maintain the site, or um, they can build it from scratch themselves. Now, we have a lot of um, HTML editors and other things in place, so that it's pretty easy to do. You know, the process is pretty easy. But what was so great about this is we got to build it ourselves, so we were able to come up with the user interfaces, how that was going to work, um, the database design, how we wanted it to function, what functionality we wanted to give, and how easy we wanted to make it for the user. So we came up with all of that. In addition, once we had the whole product built, um, it was how to build a customer and recurring billing. So um, we set up that whole process. and. Um, then uh, how are we going to support this? So we have a whole customer service department around that and knowledge base and videos. And so I mean, it was just the full end-to-end -end, you know, product development and launch and support. So it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot from that. So many of the ends, I mean, I don't get other IT people around here to do That's what wants to talk about exciting projects. So, yeah. Yes. I um I design things like Google Analytics, but more focused on your customers. Yeah, the visualizations and things like that. Yeah, design. Um. My most exciting project, I think, was my latest project so at the common club at my house. We like a mini coffee 
few internships in different types of fields. So I had an internship at, uh, for the government, for example, a research internship. Um, also interned with ConAgra a while ago. Um, and they offer a program where you actually get to try all the different IT positions within the organization. So um, just look at your options out there. Don't hesitate. <coughs> Now we run a book that we love, and so a lot of fun to see the kids are so excited. But there are some kids that just naturally have the patience, and they're they're trying to build you know, an idea of, of what it really is, and how does this apply? You know, and and some of them don't necessarily need an answer right now. But I noticed yesterday actually some kids are saying, "When are we going to code? When are we going to code?" We're working on projects that go to that and we demo. And right now we're kind of struggling with not enough PCs for, you know, so we're trying to work in sort of a limited way. But what would you, what words of advice would you give us as a coding club to, to say, you know, basically be patient, give, give it a chance to see to see where it goes or, or why we start here? You know, not, don't give up, basically. <laughs> I think a lot of um, the things that I do it takes a lot of planning before you actually get into the actual design because I do a lot of information like interface design and stuff like that. And so you really have to plan it out before you actually start coding. And so there's a lot of stuff you can draw out before you get to that stage. That would help. I don't know how long that could draw. I do. We use for to you know, and um, the truth is, so we do some of that. Yeah, they want. They want to build the Eiffel Tower using you know, like in three, you know, in three weeks. You know, I guess it's a patience thing. So that's a good advice to say. It takes a while. You know, plan it before you can build it. Yeah. And I, yeah, you do, and you do, and we do the same thing. But there's also an agile approach that you want to take software, and it's something that you know a lot of businesses follow now. Um, but instead of Designing it all out and then building it, and maybe it is or maybe it isn't what you want. Design a little bit, build a little bit, test, and go through that process over and over. Just it's a cycle: design, build, and test. It works wonderful. Do you guys use Agile? Yeah. Uh, I actually, yesterday, like. Over an hour, like an hour and 30 minutes to around that. So, does that count? So, the hour of code is that a structured thing you bought in? How, how does that work? Like, if these girls want to go up on this and do that, how, how do you go about doing that? Does, does the coding that they've done count for an hour of code, or is it something that might be I think it's structured through the code.org site. Okay. I think they have like yeah. um, coding programs that you can log in and there's different choices. Six out of one hundred million. I I I have a question. Um uh visitors start uh regard to the steam. I think there is certainly this uh, Side words of the people in IT are those antisocial creatures <laughs> which spend uh, all day long sitting in front of a computer. And sometimes when you hear when people choose their careers, uh, they'll choose, I just don't want to do that. And I guess maybe maybe you touch on your experience here, here in front of six young kids who will be picking their careers or speak with their peers. So, what's, what's your day is like? And who, who are your peers? Um, I'll answer that. Uh, so there are there are employees within Blue Cross that love to code and sit at their desk and not have a lot of interaction with people, and that's great. And there are a lot of people that actually aren't like that and are very social. And so bringing the social aspect to the work is awesome because those are the folks who make the team fun. Like they'll think of the you know uh, fun things to do, like it. For example, we do agile development, and it's a three-week sprint. But the first day is all-day planning. And if you think about spending all-day planning, that sounds kind of boring. It does to me. I know it does to a lot of them. But the 
fund created. Folks within the team will figure out how to make the fun. So they'll have a food day, so they'll bring in food, so there's fun food around to eat. They'll all wear jeans, they're more relaxed. They'll create like a trivia game to play in the middle of the planning so that it breaks it up. And so there are a lot of very creative minds that make up the IT community. And so it's not just what, you know, kind of the old stereotype of um, geeky, nerdy, I just want to, you know, do this. But those people that are very, very smart that code like that very seriously, we need them too. So it's great to have both aspects. And, and of course, a lot of people in between that like the social aspect, they may not be thinking of it, but love uh, being involved with it. Yeah, second thought. There's a spectrum of you know whether you prefer you're more of an introvert or an extrovert, and there's opportunities in technology all throughout that spectrum. And maybe you might start out an introverted, head down on the desk, um, code out a whole solution. You might realize in a couple of years you might want to try, or even a few months, um, that you might want to try something else. And the, and the great thing about technology is that there's just so many opportunities and there's so many different goals that you can fill. And you're never really locked into anything like um, staring at a screen all day. That's not what you want. <laughs> okay, so that's um, about the end of the session. I'm going to see have some final remarks for the girls. I guess I'd just like to mention, um, you know, we were talking about fun aspects of, of IT and video games robotics and all that, but uh, building a web page is a lot of fun. There's a lot of instant gratification in building a quick web page. So if you're trying to introduce somebody in, in that, building a web page is a great way to do it. JavaScript, using JavaScript, and that is so quick and you can do so many things with it. Um, I don't know if you guys have told them that, but if I remember building my first web page and I was here at UNO and go, wow, I did that. <laughs> you know, I made this appear on the screen. So it's a good way to encourage young people to get started. Yeah. Do you still have your math too? That's <laughs> what I was thinking more. Yeah, I was thinking that I also started on websites when I was probably 11 or 12. Um, I created a fan site for my favorite man at the time, Destiny's Child. Um, <laughs> but so um, it was a lot of fun, and it was something that I kind of lost track of through high school, and until I got to college and realized, oh, I really did have fun. I enjoy making that stuff. It is really gratifying. Um, so figuring out that you like it as young as you can is excellent, and keep having fun with it. Anyway, one one more thing. If if, uh, if I didn't mention this, my team back at the office would be very disappointed. We recently, um, thinking of how to bring fun into the workplace, we recently had something we called Iteration 48. And what it was was a hackathon. And if you are an IT, you may know what a hackathon is. But um, basically what we did was we gave the entire IT team the opportunity to create an idea that they would want to develop in 48 hours. And we had 50 ideas that came forward, and out of those 50 ideas, 15 teams were formed, and um, we had it, just the level of energy it brought to the team and the morale and just the, the opportunity and excitement for them to create something. We put no rules upon it on what you had to create, whether it was something for the business or something outside. Um, and most of the there were there had to be 15 teams, and they started on a Wednesday at 5 o'clock and finished at 8 a.m. on Friday morning. So literally some of the folks were in the office from Wednesday afternoon until Friday morning. We had a lot of cans of air um, freshener. <laughs> people say we were for a long time. But we had so much fun and on Friday morning as the executives come in and listen to those teams demo what they had built and created. And it was amazing when you give a, a team of often very creative people the opportunity to do something like that with no rules on it. They, it is amazing what they created. And it was from apps that just helped them do their jobs better and easier in IT to one team created an app. Now we're in the insurance business, health insurance business, that they created an app where somebody who needs to have knee surgery could 
to go out and ask for bids so doctors then could say, I'll do your knee surgery for $4,000. And the next person, you know, would say, oh, I, you know, I'll do it for five. And it, within 40 hours, they literally created a demo enough where we could see on the screen what, this, what the customer or the client or um, patient was seeing and what the provider was. So things like that really bring a lot of creativity and energy and fun to the workplace. We, that was much more um, successful than we ever dreamed it would be, and now I'm sure it's something we're going to do every year because it creates so much excitement. There were people in other departments that were very disappointed they didn't have an opportunity to participate. So I think when we do it next year, it will be people within other areas of the company partnering with IT folks to create cool apps. But anyway, it's just something that was very fun and wanted to make sure. So those are really exciting when you do things like we have like limited time. So uh, let's uh, give a panel a hand. Uh, um, I would like to continue with one thing. So we have been talking about participation of women in IT. And uh, if you look at the flyer on the two sides of it, so in the, on the page of, of Ada Love, you see that there's not much professional information there. So she was born. You know, she married, she captured her paper, so that's the one thing. But really when I went to the web, went to the Google and other web pages, we it was basically she got married so and so, she had three children, and you know, she died so and so that. But if you look at the other side, about a hundred years later, with great offer, everything that is professional. I mean she was married, why don't you she had kids, but you know, she didn't have a family life. But those are not there. So it's it's not that you know you don't you don't you do balance both family and professional life, but as you can see in a hundred years, the professional things do get kind of highlighted. So if this trend continues, it does show that you know you are thinking of women in IT as professional hobbies, for example. So that's a positive trend. Let's keep it up. And thank you all for coming.